Would it be fair to say when you're evaluating individual companies, you're very bottoms up, but just hearing you talk through a lot of this in past conversations we've had, I think that you guys take this macro view of kind of where, where are we today macro wise, where are we going? And then you go look at the companies in those areas in which you guys believe will have uh, upside in the future. And a lot of times it's even places where maybe they're not popular today, but they end up being. And then when you find those companies, you start bottoms up. Is that a, a fair way to view kind of the process you guys go through? I mean, I'd say on a week to week basis, even on a month to month or a year to year, we might have theses that continue to get formed top down by our bottoms up work and vice versa, right? Where uh, our assumption, like I, I think the way we think about it is the, 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 when we get into the room and we're assessing any company, anything bottoms up is that we just don't know anything. We just check everything at the door and say, we just don't know. So what are the assumptions we may have made that are wrong? Uh, what are these new assumptions we should start making now based on this data? And how does that help inform us for our long-term capital deployment? Remember, we're venture investors. So our timeline is 5, 10, 15, 20 years in some cases. Um, as an angel investor, I, I, have a, I have an investment from 2005 that's still not liquid, right? It's still there and I'm still hanging on. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and then when you start thinking about uh, going from 10 to 50 to 100 to 200 investments, the, uh, your, your thesis has to be different. You have to start thinking about your portfolio, your liquidity needs um, for yourself and your LPs, uh, but also what you need to do in order to make better decisions in the uh, macro and micro environment. The reason macro is important is you have to understand the bottoms up demand signals you see. Are they gonna continue to see tailwinds or are they gonna hit headwinds? Are they in a regulatory environment or not? And, and I think you know what you've seen unfortunately in, again, housing, education, and healthcare, uh, sort of being the, the main ones I'd focus on, the reason why they've had a harder time is that they're, they're more akin to political and regulatory behavior, uh, where you have institutions that uh, are set to make sure those things uh, stay status quo. It's hard to innovate. And so even if you see a company that's bottoms up, they might have a small uh, a niche that's working, they can get slapped down by the regulatory uh, uh, side of the house, uh, and, and sometimes that may or may not work, right? Like in the case of Uber, they hit a lot of uh, um, turmoil, sort of lift. They were able to make it through because it, what was happening is that we were moving away from a world of being regulated to a world of being unregulated uh, to make it more beneficial to the consumer, make it more beneficial, in my opinion, to the folks that were being employed uh, uh, to make money through that, through that remnant inventory. Same with Airbnb, et cetera. And so you kind of have to look at that and say, well, what is what are going to be those types of change that will happen that are effective uh, for education, uh, healthcare, and, and housing? And uh, the question you ask is, in this environment, is that helping to accelerate some of those industries to deregulate um, and get more uh, innovation and to be able to help build in that direction? Or are they going to stay status quo? Um, and that's where we spend a lot of our time thinking through, which is you have to understand that part of the ma uh, macro. Uh, and, and gather uh, data on that side as well. And, and, and that's the hard part. Like that's the art on top of the science, which is science is not gonna tell us what's gonna happen. We, we're, we can only know what's happening on the ground and we can only know, again, bottoms up, like, you, know, you know, actual trends and demand signals. We don't know how long that's gonna last depending on what type of environment, what type of investment we're making. Um, and so that's why we do focus a little bit of our time on lobbying. We focus a little bit of our time building those relationships um, uh, with, uh, you know, the central government. And, you know, it, it, I think a lot of people don't like to say it, but, you know, I think the biggest threat to the United States is not understanding what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in India, and what's happening in China. And in China more specifically, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, like, I think longer term, we have a better model of incentive alignment here in the United States like we have over the last 400 years. However, uh, China understands their incentive model. They're copying us. They're getting into that direction. Um, and even though they are centralized, they've been figuring out ways to deregulate pieces of their economy to be able to innovate the same way which we do here in the United States. Uh, but at the same time, they do have a top-down macro perspective on what they need to focus on. And we've lost a lot of that, in my opinion, here in the United States post-World War II, uh, up until maybe the uh, early to late uh, 70s and 80s, uh, you know, I, I went to a China, what they call it the China FinTech Conference. Um, and who, here's who put it up. You had the state government uh, of China, uh, the People's Bank, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name, of China. Uh, you had the top 10 universities uh, stand this up. 
and there was only one um, uh, outside uh, speaker and one uh, uh, outside participant, and that was me. And I went there with thinking, oh, oh I'm curious to see what was going to happen. And I, and, I, and I did a keynote uh, a speech there on behalf of not just us, but even our, our company, Carta, on what's happening in the financial industry. And on their, uh, you know, before I had started, uh, they had a couple days uh, of all the companies that were uh, pitching. You had some of the, uh, you had the heads of government, you had the heads of states there, you had the heads of universities there, um, you had innovation cycles, you had startup companies there, like the top 10. Um, and then you had folks like Tencent, Alibaba, all these guys there talking about what's gonna happen. You basically had the smartest people in the room, regardless of market cap, talking about what is important. And guess what they were talking about? They were talking about how much we need to pay attention to crypto, uh, what reserve currencies look like in the future, where they need to innovate, where they need to subsidize, where the government needs to spend more time uh, 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 helping uh, companies get off the ground, and where in the world should they be paying attention. And you know, luckily for us, uh, you know, I. I you know, we're, we've been in the lead for a while, but uh, you know, we have to be kind of vigilant, is that they basically said the only country we need to pay attention to, the only innovation centers we need to pay attention to, nowhere else in the world we need to pay attention to, is the United States and Silicon Valley specifically.